Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus and for his sacrificial, substitutionary death, burial, and resurrection so that all who trust in him will have eternal life. We pray today, Lord, if there's anyone in the sound of my voice who's not trusted Jesus, that they will before this message is over. For it's in his mighty name I pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, we're back in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and our text is verses 1 through 7, 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. We've been doing a verse-by-verse study through the book of 1 Timothy. Last week, we talked about uh, the pastor and his calling and his uh, classifications. Today, I want to talk about the qualifications or the character of the pastor. Beginning in verse 1, it is a trustworthy statement. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So last week we looked at uh, the pastor and we talked about the classifications. We said that the Bible primarily uses three words to refer to the office of pastor. That would be elder, bishop, or overseer, and shepherd, pastor. Those are used interchangeably for the same, same person, the same role, and that is pastor. We said that pastors are not apostles. And uh, the, the, the remainder of this text deals with the character qualifications, the character qualifications. We talked about the classifications and the callings. We said that God has to call a pastor and the church calls their own pastor. And so uh, we looked at that. Today we're going to deal with these last four or five verses that deal with the character qualifications. Now, the character traits or the spiritual qualifications may be generally divided in this text into three major classifications or three headings. They are the pastor's internal character, the pastor's domestic character, and the pastor's social character. And so that's our outline we'll be looking at. Uh, You may be familiar with author and uh, writer or Eugene Peterson. He's the man who uh, published The Message. It is a uh, Bible uh, paraphrase. And uh, it can shed some insight on Scripture. But he also wrote other works, and he wrote a book called The Unnecessary Pastor. The Unnecessary Pastor. In that book, he said this, and I think it's uh, uh, something that we need to think about. He said, congregations get their idea of what makes a pastor from the culture, not from the Scriptures. They want a winner. They want their needs met. They want to be part of something zesty and glamorous. With hardly an exception, they don't want a pastor at all. They want managers of their religious company. They want a pastor they can follow so they won't have to bother with following Jesus. Now that's a a very, very telling statement. And I'm thanking God after, at the end of 16 years I've been here at this church, nobody's ever expected me to be zesty or glamorous. (laughs) Never been accused of that. Uh, but uh, this church, I remember one time I was being interviewed by a pastor search committee and one guy asked one question and I really didn't know how to answer him. He said to me, he said, are you a pastor or are you a CEO? Well, I've thought about that quite a bit because I'm certain there are churches that don't really want a pastor, they want a CEO. Well, I'm not a CEO and I try to be a pastor And uh, I'm thanking God that SCBC wants pastors and not CEOs. The central truth of this message is pastors are to be qualified inside and out. Pastors are to be qualified inside and out. 
So let's start by looking at the pastor's internal character, the qualification of the pastor's internal character. Now understand that all of these character traits that I'm going to cover here are the way the pastor has lived since he's been saved. Okay, that's, that's key because even the Apostle Paul who wrote this was a blasphemer and a persecutor before he became the Apostle Paul. So we're talking about character that is demonstrable since conversion. That's what we're looking at here. The first one is, it says, he must be above reproach, above reproach. Above reproach means that there are no legitimate charges leveled against the man. There's nobody that's out here saying he did such and such, and it means that there's no scandal associated with the name or his dealings with other people. Now, I remember back in the 80s, uh, way back in the 80s, can y'all believe that? I remember back in the 80s, there was a lot of scandals around televangelists and, and uh, public preachers, but on a more local level, many of the local pastors had to supplement their income by selling products that were involved in pyramids, pyramid schemes. Uh, several pastors got caught up in that, and, and, and uh, they were kind of innocent, but kind of not, you know what I mean? They, it, it, was, it was a money-making thing, and a lot of pastors got blamed for being dishonest. There was reproach then that was put upon their name, and pastors must carefully guard their business and other interests so as to avoid even the appearance of corruption and dishonesty. In other words, there's no legitimate accusation being made against a person that's uh, a pastor or someone desiring to be a pastor. The second word is temperate, temperate. It's, awful, it's often translated as sober and or vigilant. It means to not be a drunkard uh, or to become intoxicated. And since he talks about that in the next verse, I think here what he means is a pastor must be of sound mind and alert. He must know where he's at and what's going on, unlike some public figures today who don't know what day it is, but nonetheless, uh, he, he must be of sound mind and alert, both physically, mentally, and spiritually. He's got to have a clear thinking head. He can't be on prescription pills and out of his mind half the time and that sort of thing. Prudent, prudent. The Greek word for prudent is also translated sober, but in this, ca in this context, it most likely means discreet, discreet. Pastors must be discreet in their dealings with other people. It means that he's self-controlled and he's in control in situations that he finds himself in because pastors are thrown into a lot of situations that they don't write books on telling you how to do this or what to do next. And so you got to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And one thing above all else is you got to be discreet. You can't go around telling things you know to everybody you know. And it also means that pastors should never travel Pastors should never travel, not even on a short trip, with a woman who is not his mother, his sister, or an immediate family member. Not even to the store with a woman other, that's not his wife. Pastors should never, never, never dine alone with another woman. That is not using good discretion. And so... Uh, I know that there are pastors who, who uh, think that's foolish or legalistic, but I'm here to tell you to push the boundaries of discretion is not only foolish, it's plain reckless. And pastors, uh, we're not above slipping into sin if we put ourselves in a compromise in position. Pastors are to be respectable. Now that's the same Greek word as used in verse 9 where it says he wants the women to adorn themselves with proper clothing modestly, modestly. That's the same word there, respectably. And we looked at that when we talked about women's behavior in church, and it means outfitted. It means well-organized. It means put together and adequately uh, uh, arranged for whatever's coming up. And so pastors, I, I think what he's trying to say here is they ought to be men who've got their act together. Uh, don't, don't, don't walk around disheveled all the time and, and, and you know, uh, late for everything. Just showing up late all the time or missing appointments or, or forgetting things and things like that. You ought to be respectable, well-arranged. People ought to be able to depend on their pastor. Then hospitable. 
Now, this means that to, uh, the pastor treats guests in a welcoming manner, in a welcoming manner. Now, understand that pastors are human beings just like everybody else. Some pastors are extroverts. They're extroverts. Now, uh, that means that extroverts are people who, the longer they're around crowds, the more energized they become. They draw energy from other people. So they're always around people. They love it. They just love it. Uh, that's some pastors. Uh, 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 other, <laughs> other pastors are introverts. Other pastors are introverts. Now, that doesn't mean introverts don't like people. But what it means is this, rather than being energized by people, they're drained by people. And extroverts, have, I'm sorry, introverts have to recharge their batteries by themselves. They get alone with God, they need peace and quiet. And so some pastors are extroverts, some pastors are introverts, but whether they're extrovert or introvert, they have to be hospitable. Uh, and so it's harder for some than it is others. But every pastor has a unique personality, and perhaps in the area of uh, uh, hospitality, the uniqueness of the pastor's personality probably shows more than anywhere else. And so uh, uh, every pastor uh, has to be reasonable and reasonably hospitable and willing to engage in hospitality with people in the church. And then it says, able to teach. Now, notice what it does not say. It does not say has a desire to teach. It says he has, he has a ability to teach. Now, uh, we need to be specific. Teach what? Teach the Word of God. Amen? Uh, uh, if you know your Bible, you're going to find this funny. If you don't find this funny, then you don't know your Bible. Uh, and you'll know exactly what I mean when I get done saying this. Uh, this came, uh, a young pastor was being interviewed by a pastor search committee. The chairman of the committee said, uh, son, do you know the Bible? He said, yes, sir, I do. He said, which part do you know the best? He said, I know the New Testament the best. He said, well, tell us the story of the Good Samaritan. And so he did. He said, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus who went down to Jericho by night and fell among stony ground. And thorns came up and half choked him to death. And he said, what shall I do? He said, I'll rise and go to my father's house. So he climbed up a sycamore tree. <laughs> the next day, Solomon and his wife, Gomorrah, <laughs> came by and carried him down to the ark for Moses to take care of. As he was going through the eastern gate into the ark, he caught his hair on a limb, and he hung there for 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> and afterward, he was a-hungered, and the ravens came and fed him. <laughs> the next day, three wise men came down and carried him down to Nineveh, where, where, where he, got, uh, he got found by Delilah sitting on a wall. And he said, chunk her down, boys, chunk her down. They said, how many times shall we chunk her down? Till seven times? He said, nay, till 70 times seven. <laughs> so they chunked her down 490 times, and she bust asunder in their midst. They picked up 12 baskets of fragments which were left and asked, in the resurrections, whose wife shall she be? <laughs> The chairman of the pastor search committee said to the other guys, guys, I think we ought to call this young man. He lacks experience, but he sure does know his Bible. <laughs> well, obviously, uh, the pastor ought to know the stories of the Bible, amen? And so when we talk about the pastor should know what to teach, the content of the pastor's teaching is found in 2 Timothy 4, and listen to what it says. Paul says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his, his kingdom, preach the word. There it is. He said, preach it in season and out of season. What does that mean? It means preach the word when it's convenient. Preach the word when it's not convenient. Preach the word when people like it. Preach the word when people don't like it. Preach the word. That's what it means. And so praise God, that's what we do. 
And pastors are to preach the Word of God. We don't preach headlines. We don't preach social causes. We don't preach politics. We don't preach ten, trends and fashions. Listen, we don't even get to preach our own hobby horses. We need to preach the Word. Amen? Pastors should preach everything in God's Word. Now, there are things in God's Word that thrill our soul and comforts our hearts in times of grief. The Bible is a book. The Bible is, is, it contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are binding. Its histories are true. Its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. Practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, can comfort to cheer you. It's the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here, paradise is restored. Heaven is open. The gates of hell are disclosed. Christ is its grand subject. Our good is designed. The glory of God, it's in. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, a river of pleasure. It's given to you in life. It'll be open in the judgment and will be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, regards, regards the greatest labors, and condemns all who trifle with its content. It is the Word of God, the living God. It is indestructible, incorruptible, indispensable, infallible, and inexhaustible. That is what we ought to be preaching. Amen? Amen. And men called a ministry... And to minister to the flock of God must feed people the Word of God. Therefore, to be able to teach, the pastor ought to know the content. And when it says he's able to teach, he needs to know what the Bible says. But it also means he must know his people. Because it doesn't do a lot of good to say a bunch of stuff that nobody understands. Amen? And so... Uh, you got to know how to communicate to the people you're speaking to. I used to, I, I knew a young evangelist. He was on fire, and he had, he was like a he was like a windmill, a lot of movement and hot air. But that was about it, you know. And uh, uh, he got a, he got a chance to go down to Belize one time. He went down there on a mission trip. He was so excited about it. Went down there, and he came back. And I said, "How'd it go?" He said, "Well, I learned something." I said, what's that? He said, man, I got this sermon. He said, during the sermon, he said, I really, I really, uh, really hit on the evils of television and all the bad stuff you watch on television, how rotten it's got. He said, I went on and on about that. He said, after it was over, the, the head of the whole group came up to me and said, pastor, nobody in our village even has a television. <laughs> The point is, what good did he preach against the evils of television? He didn't know his audience. People, you got to know who you're preaching to. Listen, pastors are not preaching sermons. Now, you can reduce it down to that. And, and connect group teachers, listen to this. You're not teaching a lesson. It's not what you're doing. You're not teaching a lesson. You are not teaching a class. I'm not preaching to a church. We're not teaching lessons. Here's what it is. The goal is to teach people the Word of God so they can become devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And listen, when you teach people, it's a lot different than dispensing information. Because you got to know if people are hearing you, if they know what you're saying, if it's coming across. And not only that, the Bible says, be doers of the word, not hearers, only deceiving your own selves. And if we're doers of the word, the Bible says we'll be blessed in that which we do. How is anybody going to be a doer of the word if somebody doesn't tell them how to do the word? And so all teaching must be geared towards application to make us like Jesus. Amen. Thank you. And then he says, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable. Now, that little phrase all goes together. You could break it all up, but actually I think it's painting a picture of a personality. Not addicted to wine or pugnacious. Now, what does pugnacious mean? When I was telling uh, uh, the PowerPoint people uh, what, what it is, we, we, uh, we're going to have to look that up see what it means, because it's not a word you use every day. Pugnacious literally means brawler, brawler. Somebody likes to fight all the time. 
And so if you put this whole phrase together, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle and peaceable, what you see is that the man under consideration for pastoral ministry ought not be engaging in rowdy behavior that is often called partying today. He's not a cowboy out here looking to knock somebody out the window of the Long Branch Saloon. Uh, this is a guy who's put all that behind him and doesn't go there and doesn't do that. He's a gentle person. He's a peaceable person. And where does that peace come from? It comes from being right in his heart with God. Paul wrote in Philippians 4, 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And here it is. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so here's a man who's learned to uh, uh, deal, with his, deal with his problems and his emotions with, with, with Christ and not out in the public. And then it says, free from the love of money. Here's an area that has destroyed more churches and ruined more ministries than perhaps anything else. Over the years, I've known a few pastors. Over the years, I've known a few pastors who always felt called to go to another church when the salary was bigger at the next church. And so, uh, I thank God I was never tempted that way. <laughs> Y'all think about that. Uh. <laughs> I, I pastored one time at a church in, in rural middle Tennessee, and this guy, I was, I, was, I was preaching as a guest preacher at another church, and this man in the crowd, he, he came to me at the end of the service. He says, would you consider uh, maybe if God's calling you to Kentucky? Well, I had never thought about it, but I said, well, what are you? He said, come up and visit with me. I'll show you the church. He said, I, I want you to see the church. And I said, all right. So Cindy and I drove up there and uh, uh, got out. It was a little one-room building that had a stove in the middle of it for a church. And, and uh, he was showing us out there. And uh, he said, now, here's what we're going to do for you, preacher. He said, you see that? That's a brand new double wide over there. And we're going to let you stay in there as long as you're our pastor. And... Not only that, we'll let you drive a school bus or make money any other way you can. And just as a bonus, we're, in the summertime, we will throw in all the vegetables you can eat. Well, that'd be zero for me. <laughs> Somebody said, you know you're a country preacher if the only time you ever lock your vehicle is when squash is in season. For the rest of you, that's because people keep putting it in your car. <laughs> anyway, the love of money was a problem even in Paul's day. In fact, Paul says one of the glaring signals that a person is a false prophet is they love money. Listen to what he said about those preachers. He says in 1 Timothy 6, 5, that they are depri depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining, here it is, that godliness is a means of gain. They figured out they can make a buck off Christianity, and that's what they're in it for. Beloved, the television and the radio and the internet are filled with these hucksters that are out here thinking that religion is a way to make money. False prophets, and they don't need to be in pulpits. Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. You'll either love one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And so uh, that is why a man who loves money ought not go into the ministry. Uh, because the only way you can make money in the ministry is to do something wrong. And I'm not saying that in any kind of bad way. But the ministry is not a place to get rich. And then it says in verse 6, not a new convert, not a new convert. Not a new convert speaks more to the spiritual maturity than it does to length of time. Unfortunately, I've known some believers who trusted Jesus as their Savior and Lord when they were wee little children. 
And for some reason, maybe they didn't get discipled or they strayed away from the faith. And they've been a Christian now for 20 years, but they're not spiritually mature. And so they wouldn't necessarily be a new convert based on length of time, but spiritually, they're still a new convert. And so uh, uh, not a new convert means that the pastor has to demonstrate before other people that he has developed a spirituality to the point that he no longer needs somebody else um, to spoon-feed him the ABCs and the simple doctrines of the faith, but is able to teach those doctrines with competence. Pastor's got to be able to do that. And then it says, lest he fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil in verse 6. Now, the devil, and we won't get into this a whole study, but just let me say, the devil was originally created by God, and he was called the anointed cherub that covers. Now, I know a lot of times people say the devil was an angel. Actually, he was more than an angel. He had an exalted position in heaven. According to Ezekiel 28, he was the anointed cherub that that, uh, conducted the worship in heaven, if you will. And the Bible says that his heart was lifted up in pride. And in Isaiah 14, he starts saying, I will exalt myself above the heights. And, and, and basically, he wanted to overthrow God and become, uh, become God himself. And so he was banished from heaven. Now, the reason the devil sinned was due to his pride. That's what it was. And that's what Paul said. He said, don't put a new convert in the pastoral position lest he be conceited and fall into the same condemnation incurred by the devil. And so uh, 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 the pastor ought not be a new convert because it might lift him up in pride and make him think that he uh, deserves something or that he is better than other people. In other words, if he's not spiritually mature, it'll swell up his heart and he'll do great damage to the church. And that attitude in a pastor of pride and selfishness will destroy a church. So pastors must be qualified internally. They should be ordained and called by a local church after they consistently govern their, govern their own behavior according to these qualifications. Number two, I want you to see the pastor's domestic character. Domestic character. It says in verse uh, that he must uh, keep his advantage. uh, Verse two, the husband of one wife is what I want to deal with. Now that phrase, husband of one wife, has been abused and misunderstood. And many people have used this husband of one wife as a way to exclude Anyone who has suffered through the unfortunate uh, crisis of divorce. However, that is not what Paul is saying here. Now, divorce is a subject we could talk about later under, but that's not what he's doing here. You say, why is that? Because there was at least five words in the Greek language that specifically would have meant divorce, but the Holy Spirit did not lead the Apostle Paul to use any of those words. He uses the word husband of one wife. Neither does he, neither is he addressing polygamy. He's not talking about a man who's got several wives. How do you know that? Because in Ephesus, they didn't have a problem with polygamy. It was not commonly practiced in that day and time amongst their culture. And so it's not polygamy, and it doesn't mean divorce. Well, what does it mean? Well, most Bible scholars that I've read say the phrase husband of one wife means a man who is wholly and completely devoted to one woman. Now, what it means literally is the man loves his wife. He loves his wife. And the man who is a husband of one wife is a man who is devoted to one single woman, and that woman would be his wife. It means that the pastor or those under consideration for pastoral ministry are devoted exclusively to their wife until death do them part. Now, I heard about a preacher who took a vacation, and while he was on vacation, he was sitting on the back pew, and and, uh, uh, he was nodding off. The preacher was really boring, and uh, 
And so the preacher noticed everybody going to sleep. And so he pulled something that I, I don't think I'd do. He, he, he said to everybody, he said, I got a confession to make. Well, when the preacher says that, everybody wakes up, you know. And, and uh, when everybody looked up, he said, I got a confession to make. I have been in love with another woman that's not my wife. And while everybody was on the edge of their seat, he said, and that woman is my mother. <laughs> so that old preacher is on vacation sitting back there, and he thinks to himself, well, I'm going to remember that because next time people are going to sleep on me, I'm going to say it. So a couple of months go by, and he's up there preaching away, and everybody's snoring, and, and uh, he says, I got a confession to make. So they woke up. He said, I have been in love for a long time with a woman who's not my wife. And then he had a senior moment. <laughs> and he said, for the life of me, I can't remember who she is. <laughs> So you got to be careful now. <laughs> but in all honesty, I will say this. The Lord has blessed me to be married to a woman who's very easy to love. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And she's been the greatest asset to any ministry I might have. Not like... John Wesley, founder of Methodism. They say his wife regularly beat him. <laughs> you don't laugh at the jokes, but that's funny to you. I don't get it. <laughs> but the greatest asset to every pastor is a Christian wife who is also mature in the Lord and can give wise spiritual counselor counsel to her husband. And the reason that is is because God puts husbands and wives together. He gives you what's lacking of your personality. I mean, I'm way off over here and my wife's over there. And what happens is, is we've done knocked all the rough edges off each other. So now we're kind of in the middle. And uh, so I've, I've learned that she's, she, she sees things that I don't see. So uh, the husband of one wife means that they team together in ministry and just like the Bible says, her children shall rise up and call her blessed. Amen. Amen. Pastors are to manage their home. They're to manage their home. He must be one who manages his own household well. Now, pa uh, uh, one pastor said that he was being scolded by an angry Sunday school teacher. She came to him because his children were so unruly in Sunday school. She couldn't do anything with them. And she came to him. She said, Pastor, why are your children the worst kids in Sunday school? He said, because they spend all their time playing with the deacon's kids. I... <laughs> but it says, keeping his children under control. The word manage here means to rule over and to oversee. Now, the Bible does not condone and does not endorse the harsh discipline and, and, and extreme treatment of anybody, especially a husband toward a wife or a father toward children. The Bible don't condone beating. The Bible don't condone don't berating. And, and the Bible doesn't say uh, 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 the, use some kind of uh, sticks and stones to beat your children in submission. No. The idea is the pastor has learned how to manage his children in a godly way and manage his home in a godly way. And notice what else it says, with all dignity, with all dignity. And uh, scholars are one way or the other on this, and here's what I mean. Uh, with all dignity, it could mean here that he has raised his children in such a way that they act dignified. Well, whatever that means, uh, it means they act dignified. Well, but I think in view of what he says in the next verse, I think what it means is, is he handles the discipline and the affairs of home in a dignified manner. Because he says in verse 5, if man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? 
Somebody wrote, the elder must first prove the intimacy, uh, let me slide, an elder must first prove in the intimacy and exposure of his own home his ability to lead others to salvation and sanctification. There, in the home, he proves God, he proves God has gifted him uniquely to spiritually set the example of virtue, to serve others, to resolve conflict, to build unity, and maintain love. If he cannot do those essential things there, why would anyone assume he would be able to do them in the church? And I'll just condense that down and say it this. If a man's not a Christian at home, he's got a good reason to doubt he's a Christian anywhere. Amen? And so a pastor must be qualified internally, and he must be qualified domestically before he can pastor a church. And then finally, the pastor's social character. Social character. It says he must be of good reputation to those outside the church so they'll not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now that doesn't mean that the world approves of his preaching nor his theology. That's not what, that's, we're, not, we're not trying to make the, make the world like us. That's, that's not what we're doing. It means that his dealings with those outside the church, he always remembers that he is a representative of Christ and the church that he is privileged to serve. Cindy and I, when we first got saved, or, well, she'd been saved. I, I just got saved, and we joined the church, and uh, we learned a lot. We had a wonderful pastor. He was a wonderful pastor. He was a, a, a very evangelistic, uh, good preacher. We loved him. I learned a lot from him. But he was a very competitive individual. I mean, competitive. And we had a softball team at our church. And he was in the midst of all that. And uh, uh, after about halfway through the season, some of the, some of the church leaders had a conference with the pastor and, and they asked him, you either got to stop playing softball or you got to stop being our pastor. He, 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 he disputed every call. He was loud. He was... He was what normal people, not, not he what some people do at baseball games. But here's what they said. They said, we can't take our children to the church softball games because we don't want them to see how you behave. Now see, that's his behavior socially. He's got to have a good reputation outside the church. Uh, he can't be an embarrassment to the church He's got to, got, 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 to, got to behave himself when he's in front of people. And pastors are not perfect. But the Bible and the church requires qualified men. I said qualified men who are the husbands of one wife to pastor their churches. I don't know if y'all remember or not, but in the very first sermon, I pointed out in 1 Timothy 1-2, Paul wrote to Timothy, my true child in the faith, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And if you remember that, I told you that mercy was added in the introduction only in this pastoral epistle. Nowhere else does Paul put mercy in there. And I said that that's apropos because pastors need God's mercy. I know I need God's mercy, but I also need your mercy. I looked up the dictionary of mercy in the, uh, I looked up the definition of mercy in the Greek dictionary. And I was looking at it in the context of pastors needing mercy. And I laughed when I read it because this is the, this is the, dic, uh, the dictionary's definition. Mercy is kindness or goodwill toward the miserable and afflicted. Join with the desire to help them. I, Pastor Brad, Pastor Eric, and all pastors, we need goodwill toward the miserable and afflicted. 
and your desire to help, we need mercy. We pastors need mercy. In a small cemetery parish in a courtyard in only England stands a granite tombstone with this inscription. John Newton, pastor, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slavers in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. And you may not remember his name, but all of us know the song he wrote as a testimony of his life. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, saved a wretch like me. Would you stand with me? Bow your heads as we prayerfully consider what God is saying to us this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I would just pose this question to you this morning. Pastors need mercy, but we all need mercy. And I would just ask the question, has there been a time in your life when you can definitely say that you experienced the salvation, mercy, and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you turned your life over to the King of mercy, the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you experienced, by faith, the amazing grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? If you've not been saved this morning, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, standing right where you are in your heart. I want you to just say these words, and now listen, this is not a magic prayer. It's not a, this is not an incantation. This is not anything like that. It's if you, if, you, if you confess with the heart and believe in your heart that God has raised the Lord Jesus from the... And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So if you want to be saved this morning, you've never trusted Christ. Here's a, here's a guide you can go by. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry that I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. Will you forgive me of my sins? Because Jesus died on the cross for me. And then he rose from the grave. And I believe that today. And I believe he's coming again. So today I turn my life over to you. Just as I am, I turn my life over to you. Here I am, Lord. Use me. If you said that prayer this morning, in just a few moments, we're going to begin to sing. And I'm going to ask you to do something that may seem a little bold. I want you to just step right out and come down here. Pastor Brad, Pastor Eric, we got deacons down here. I'll be down here. Share that decision you made so that we can get you plugged in. Maybe this morning you got some need on your heart. You want to come to this altar. Maybe you want to place membership at Southern Calvert Baptist Church. If you've been baptized by immersion since you've been saved, uh, we, we, we'll take you on your statement of faith. But this is the invitation where you get to respond to what God says to you. Father, we pray today that if there's anyone who's not saved, that you would extend mercy and grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.